Please click got it again. Maybe we can say again. Can I do it? Sure, sure, sure. I don't want to do something. Okay, now we're good to go. I can start. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited. If I do any mistakes, please just forgive it from now on. <laughs> Uh, my name is Seda Altan, and I'm the director of Aura Istanbul. Uh, for the ones who join Jumartesi Aurasi uh, slash Aura on Saturdays for the first time, I'd like to give a little background on uh, Aura Istanbul. Uh, the name of Aura stands for Architecture and Urbanism Research Academy. Aura Istanbul established in 2017 as a nonprofit organization. Although we are organizing many public events, um, the main focus of the academy is to be um, a hub for um, young architects and designers with its certificate program. And in four, actually, right now in five years' time, our program became a bridge of experimentation and research. Um, our on Saturday conference hosting Yohani Palatma and Hussein Yanar today. Uh, the opening conference of the Aaron Saturday series in 2021 fall semester. Um, the talk between two professionals will focus on art in architecture, confession, intuition, experience, and life. Uh, now I'd like to give the floor to Yilma there, uh, architect and uh, one of the founders of uh, our Istanbul. Uh, Yilma's way good. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome all. Uh, we are together at our Aura on Saturday event. Uh, at the fall term opening conference today, uh, we have very valuable and very special guests from Finland. Here, Johanne Palazma and Hussein Yanar. You all know them very well. I would like to tell, uh, thank them uh, very much on behalf of Aura Istanbul for being here with us today. They honored us by accepting our invitation. I sincerely hope and wish that we will have to, the opportunity uh, to host dear Yohani and Hussein at our own place here in Istanbul. But of course, that time live as soon as possible. Uh, yes, we are very happy and excited uh, to watch this talk about experiences and thoughts on architecture, art, and life. Now, uh, I leave the word to dear Hussein Yanar, and thank you again. Uh, I really got excited uh, too. Uh, uh, uh, I try to make uh, uh, many plans, actually. Plans are not working in this case. Uh, uh, I wanted to begin to explain uh, to friends, to friends, uh, artist friends, but maybe begin to other way around. Uh, but I have to tell that what an interesting uh, life that uh, 23 years ago, you, you, Johanny, I came to this room and I, I wrote to you an email from Oxford uh, that I am moving to Finland. I was uh, <laughs> teaching in Oxford and then um, you wrote to me a beautiful uh, reply. And then we met uh, uh, like 23 years ago. And then when I entered this room, uh, I put many things in front of you. Uh, I put my projects, student projects, and my drawings and photographs and so on, some publications. And then you, you were looking at them. And then in the end, uh, you said, okay, those, those stuff can go to art and, and to architecture. Now, after 23 years, we do a discussion about art in architecture. It was a fantastic 23 years for me in Finland. I became a part of Finland, of course. And uh, 
and uh, that's why I'm very, very happy to be with you. And uh, many times we met in this table uh, that uh, you kind of, uh, you, you know what I understood, uh, you know, we people uh, uh, uh, walking like uh, in the forest uh, that I am sure you walk a lot in the forest. And then some people are whispering you many things and then, but you take some of them and you establish your way and they are so valuable uh, so that it happened to me like that in your in your room and in this specific table. Uh, uh, that's why I'm very happy. Uh, where can I begin? Uh, I, I, I wrote about you finally some, some time ago because uh, I was uh, trying to write my second book and uh, you became one of the important person in the book, like important character in my, in my uh, book, uh, forthcoming book. And uh, the King, Kingdom of Architecture, the name of the book. And then uh, uh, Alto was the, is there, Alvaro Alto is the king. You are uh, a kind of observer, philosopher, a kind of critical person, uh, an architect, of course, uh, and many identities you have. Uh, there are artists there, uh, movie director, Kaurismaki, and uh, saxophone player, uh, legendary Euro Koivistoinen, and uh, there are some monuments there, minimalism, uh, uh, sculpture of minimalism, monuments of silence, uh, and the uh, uh, monuments of freedom and so on. And there are others also, other people like uh, outsiders. And uh, in this book, uh, I wrote about you, I understood more. Uh, uh, I didn't finish easily. Uh, uh, in the end, I put everything aside. I said, you have to write your Johanny, how you know him, how uh, is that kind of, person for you and I wrote that I was relieved and then you know what I wrote. Uh, mm -hmm. In your books uh, you mention about your childhood of often uh, sometimes in your books uh, and in the last uh, uh, last uh, uh, lecture uh, of you in Black Sea University uh, you said that you are a farm boy. And I am I am also a sea boy, uh, come from uh, uh, a seaside town, uh, and uh, maybe children, child, children, um, uh, um, um, memories like dreams of today. When we rem when we uh, think about them more and more and more, you go very deep. You find yourself there because you are there actually. Uh, and it was very interesting in this process that uh, we want to give a speech about this issue. I went back again to my roots. Uh, when we get older, maybe we are going our roots more and more. In Gemlik, uh, uh, the seaside city of Gemlik, uh, we have uh, sea and we have uh, uh, olive trees behind. And then between them, we have a, a wooden city, a Greek town, beautiful, mm -hmm. like sketchy, not mm -hmm. like fixed, uh, mm -hmm. like today's modern architecture after modernism, mm -hmm. fixed everything. And that's why I fallen, I liked, I loved uh, sketchiness, like that kind of house that we lived also. And we were holding, uh, uh, uh, olives from the trees. We were holding olives from the ground. You are also mentioning about uh, touching the world, touching the world in your article. I, yeah. uh, the sense of uh, uh, uh, eyes of skin, mm. and you wrote, touch, touching the world. It affected me a lot. Touching the world. I think. Touching is so important. You touch the word, word is touching to you. Uh, 
what touched to me, what was touching to me in this uh, little town, uh, actually sea was touching and uh, nature was touching a lot. And uh, we did a lot of things, of course. Uh, everything was fiesta there, like everything. Although at home there were a lot of uh, difficulties, some old uh, relatives are getting ill and, and mm. so on. We were witnessing them, but we were also understanding that life is not shiny. And, and that's why I really would get uh, upset when I see the shiny buildings, everything fixed. Like there is no breathing, there is no, uh, how can I say, sketchiness somehow. It's difficult to explain that, but maybe deep rooted or side of me, that kind of things are coming. And one of the best things I did there, uh, I was going to a sailing club, S kind of small town sailing club. Uh, they gave a, a boat to us, the sailing boat, mm. first small one, and later the big one with the two first pe people. But I was using the backside, I was controlling. I, ha I, I uh, had a helper, a uh, friend, uh, the front uh, sailing. And then uh, I learned there uh, not how to sail on me, but also to learn uh, waves and the winds and the rains and how to find my way, like, infinitive sea. It was incredible when I think. Uh, for example, when I was also seeing a lot of natural panoramas there, like Yakamos, uh, we say Yakamos, what is in English a uh, kind of sea sparkle, mm -hmm. like uh, moonlight comes mm -hmm. to the sea in the darkness and sparkling is beginning there, like pearl. I, I was always looking at them like that. And sometimes we were going with the boat, boat, uh, and then I was putting my hand there and making like that. The kids were shouting, oh, Yakamos, Yakamos. Yakamos is a Greek, Greek mm -hmm. uh, originally Greek mm -hmm. word, I guess. Uh, that was fantastic, like see, and you go under it, and then you play with it, like touching the world, as you mm. say. That's so important. And, and then after that, uh, uh, what, what I understood that, uh, what I understood in, in my native town, mostly, there was a big artist there. Those were artistic things, but the artist was nature. The biggest artist in the world is act, I, actually nature. We cannot compete with it in every sense. Oh, and also the sunsets were amazing in, the, my, in my native town. It is still like that, but different kind of si city. It's gone, it's totally gone. And the sunsets, hundreds and hundreds different sunsets, like finishing the, like game, like play, like closing the day, you know, next day it will come again. And then I went to work in architectural school, Fine Arts Acad Academy of Istanbul, Mimar Sinan Fine Arts University at the moment. And in there, I associated uh, my living with my wooden house, like my wooden house that I was living for long, like four meters uh, narrow, 23 meters long, and four store, stores on the top between the neighbors and wooden wooden place. Like mod maybe modernistic in that way, like a boxy, mm. but the light was coming and then uh, we could see the uh, uh, uh, uh, traces of the wood and uh, on the top, uh, in infinitive uh, beams like that, like this amount mm. with the interval of the beams. And it was incredible. Uh, my school was like that, but it was big. 
I mean, in terms of uh, the size, maybe in terms of scale, it was a lot of times uh, bigger than my house, but it was a kind of Ottoman, uh, former Ottoman parliament. One of our legendary teachers, Serhat Akkaldem, made it a kind of modernist insight in it. Okay. Uh, now, uh, I brought uh, some things with me. Maybe I can show to Yohani in the same time. That was uh, my native town, Yohani. It's a beautiful, mm -hmm. narrow, unbelievable that, uh, uh, uh, patterns of the uh, houses. Should we show them? Yeah, the... Of course, we yeah. can show. We can show after you, you see he, that kind of, uh, you can see the former uh, Gemlik, nothing like that anymore. And uh, that is another rhythm of rhythms of the Gemlik, uh, photograph related with the rhythms of Gemlik. And you can see this is, uh, these are from my childhood. And that was our house, Yani. Mm -hmm. And there is one uh, store, uh, yes. shop. We were living, we were sleeping in here mm -hmm. on the third uh, floor, fourth floor, fourth floor, fourth floor actually. And so, okay, this is, there is my house somewhere here, uh, yes. So, uh, but the academy was uh, something like that. I like this photograph a lot. Very beautiful photograph. Nine, 1890, before the uh, uh, fire of uh, uh, this area. This is our, uh, th this was our academy. And in this academy, we learned, we got closer to the art because two years we were together with the art students as architectural students. And then we were passing through this uh, uh, uh, hall and then we were going to architectural school. Mm. All the all the time we were seeing exhibitions here. This is the exhibition from, I think, 1985 something, uh, or 80 beginning of 80. New tendencies in art, as far as I remember. And you know already uh, some of the perspectives in this room in this uh, school. Anyway, uh, we learn art there. Uh, together with the uh, architecture, uh, uh, uh, the combination of art and architecture was still, uh, there was a kind of, not so strong, but the feeling smell was so strong. And these two, two years, we got the feeling of it. And we made individual works with the artists, art students, and the group was with the art artists, art students. And, uh, and then beside our architectural, uh, architectural uh, uh, uh, programs and projects and so on. But what I learned there, uh, apart from this art, art was a wind uh, behind me. And then I learned uh, how to draw my professor, my unforgettable professor, Muammar Onat, had a uh, studio, architectural studio in the school, a sketch studio, but of course, everybody was doing the projects there. But the sketching was so important, maybe a part of uh, my arty life. Uh, sketch became a kind of fundamental think uh, that's why I I loved Alto's drawings uh, in my generation at that time was very uh, we liked a lot Alto's kind of drawings the Alto was our uh, how can for me at least a kind of I will ask later to you in the questions 
uh, freedom fighters, like somebody is taking uh, the pen and drawing uh, freely, uh, but also Pietila and uh, the other, uh, of course, the other architects also are very interesting for me from the north. And then this sketching, and I went to Oxford after teaching there, finishing the school after the teaching uh, many years, and then uh, I went to Oxford. Oxford was a transformation period that I was showing you some uh, student projects at that time. Mm -hmm. And we were doing, uh, first I finished uh, uh, uh, um, my uh, um, research about rhythm. Rhythm was also as a kind of art subject, not like concrete uh, subject. And, and then I began to teach and uh, uh, there was, uh, Beautiful teacher, we were uh, teaching together, Jane Tankert from, uh, originally the teacher was uh, Kevin Robotham. Uh, he, she was the student of Kevin Robotham and I was the student of academy, either with RT, either with architectural site and uh, we are trying to find ourselves and, and then we collected uh, all the energies together with Jane and then we did a kind of experimental studio. That was a turn, turning point in art, actually. And then uh, we were uh, following the artists. Uh, I found some, some uh, people there. Uh, this is uh, Anish Kapoor. We went to Anish Kapoor's mm. first exhibitions like Hayward Gallery. This red one underneath of it. I had a, a piece uh, with him. He really? did work on it, but really? in, in the same exhibition. Uh, in the same exhibition. Yes. I have to <laughs> see it because that was my turning point. Yeah. This Anish Kapoor guy, uh, Anish Kapoor, made me crazy uh, because he was trying to uh, test with the boundaries, uh, like uh, walls and the floors. He was really diving uh, through his art. Uh, uh, but he was polished guy, like mm. sterilized, you know, mm. perfect. And uh, we went with students. Of course, we got a lot of things from this Hayward exhibition. And then uh, uh, uh, uh, Richard Wilson, uh, in Saatchi Gallery, Richard Wilson's room. That was, we don't show to people, but sorry about that. Uh, we are uh, speaking. Uh, this is red uh, uh, uh, installation on top of everybody. It was amazing. We were seeing with the students that kind of things, uh, objects, uh, yellow, blue, dark, I mean, strong blue, white, and shininess, and and he was really uh, testing the floor and the other uh, other uh, wall, uh, walls. And then this room was unbelievable, Yanni. Richard Wilson room with the full of gasoline here in Saatchi Gallery. We walk uh, like uh, through that cut and you are smelling and seeing this is also another another mm -hmm. uh, atmosphere of it. The atmosphere, uh, I I really it stick to my mind over the years. That is uh, uh, uh, a kind of room of uh, Richard Wilson with the gas gas gas gasoline. Say in English, uh, gasoline full of gasoline, and then you enter from the cut like that. And of course, Cornel Cornelia Parker. Uh, is uh, is putting all the metals, uh, uh, everything, and then pressing them down like that. And anyway, we were anyway yeah, we were we were having those kinds of experiences. To, of course, Mona Hatun, mm. she came to Oxford, but those artists we tried to match the studio together with architecture and art. Uh, movie entered the scenery, Carlos Saura, Carmen, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, studio became like a kind of workshop uh, place. Uh, we were just following the students actually. And in the end, it ended up very nicely. And then I moved to Finland. And then you saw all these things. Mm -hmm. And then you said this was architecture and art. But still I, I followed these footsteps of art. And then again, one day I came to this room after five, maybe four, five years coming to Helsinki, we were again uh, discussing with you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they suggested me to make a research and then I, get, I can get some money further. And then I explained to you uh, during my teaching in different places, you said that don't do it. You just look around, I still remember. Mm -hmm. Just look around. That was my uh, renew uh, myself and Finland and so on. And then I begin to write. First was Karina Kaikkonen mm -hmm. and all the others came, architecture and art. I begin to combine them in some books and then my publications began. But what I, and in the end, I can say a couple of words. Uh, and then I went to Korea uh, uh, to find urban meditation, uh, the idea of urban meditation. Uh, I am not artist, but I'm getting closer, closer, closer to the art. I don't know where am I going? And then I work uh, with the artists, some of the artists, I try to understand their mentality. Uh, I have two friends, Karin Akak. I have many friends from Finland, uh, uh, from art and architectural side, but two friends, uh, Karin Akakunen and uh, Seppo Salminen, uh, uh, they got uh, their early experiences from their life. For example, jackets of uh, uh, my father, I wrote about to Karin, jackets of my father. Uh, Karina saw his father was, uh, he was losing, she was losing his father in front of her when she was small. I explained this because she spoke about it earlier. And then these jackets became a kind of fundamental thing in her, her, her works. And, uh, and he, she did many, many installations about mm -hmm. it. And uh, Seppo Salminen also. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, very little I can explain. Uh, he lost also uh, his uh, father in her early age, not so early age maybe, uh, but he remembers mother, father was in the war, uh, Finnish war with the Russians. They were going to sauna together uh, with the uh, friends they were all from the war. They had scars, some traces of the bullets and so on. Seppo felt that uh, uh, why he is complete, why he's not incomplete like them. And then he began to, begin to search about himself and then became an artist later and used uh, his own body as an artist, mm. like skin of him, he used his own body, like. But I try to tell that artists are different than us uh, and they are taking real life instances to go further. Maybe not all of them, but some of them. And I like it very much. Uh, without art, uh, architecture is so dry and almost engineering. And I like to be in the middle of the art in a, as an architect and also in the world without art, world is not so interesting. Mm. Let's finish my part. Well, since you began with your childhood, I will do the same. Uh, I, uh, it was my fortune that during the five war years, I spent my early childhood with my uh, farmer grandfather. 
at his small uh, farm. And um, I uh, knew the conditions of life and how to react to situations in life. Uh, I also used, uh, knew how to, to work, to do physical work. My former grandfather gave me the first uh, man's sharp knife when I was five years old and my fingers are still full of scars because I cut my fingers almost every day, but I learned to use the knife. So it was uh, an education that was, that was uh, real, uh, embodied, not, uh, not uh, intellectual. And as I was the only child at that time in the family, I had long days and I began to observe animals, for instance. And as you know, I have written a book and mm -hmm. designed an exhibition on animal architecture. I'm telling these things just to make the point that early childhood experiences can be decisive. I think, it, at least in my case, and I believe it's a normal human condition, that for half of our life, we want to walk away from uh, our childhood. And the second half, we try to walk backwards, back to the child. And now I'm 85 and I'm getting very close to my childhood memories and, and, and reactions away from the theorizing, intellectualizing, objectifying uh, phase, which lasted 30 years in, in my case. Um, I always uh, give the advice to my students, be careful choosing your friends. Friends are the most valuable things you can have. Friends read for you, travel for you. They uh, train their skills for you. They think for you. Uh, don't limit your friends to your own profession. I say this particularly to architecture students. Seek poets, writers, dancers, craftspeople, painters, sculptors, philosophers. Uh, my great luck in my life has been that probably because of my own uh, curiosity and open attitude, I have had as my friends some of the best painters and sculptors in our country and around the world, some of the finest writers and poets, uh, philosophers and designers, craftspeople, uh, now even neuroscientists in the past few uh, years. What friends, intimate friends can do to you is that they give you inside understanding of things, which is another thing, uh, completely another level of understanding than reading a book. I have no hesitation. I have not had a any hesitation to write about philosophical su sub subjects, about neurological subjects, or now uh, lately about biological su uh, subjects, because I have been in that world through my friends. I, I think this is one of the strongest uh, uh, pieces of advice I can give to students is to be careful when you choose your friends. And there's one more addition. Don't only think of the, as your potential teachers, don't only think of the living, think of the dead. One of my closest friends ever was Tapio Virkala, the legendary Finnish designer. And he told me several times that his teacher was Piero della Francesca. Mind you, Piero della Francesca died 476 years before Tapio Virkala was born. Yet, 
he uh, uh, confessed to me that Piero was his real teacher. So I advised to my students, seek the Pieros uh, in the history of art to get a real, uh, really important teacher. And this also makes me think of the uh, mistake that we usually make in our thinking. We believe in chronologies in, in the mental world, psychological world and artistic world. Chronologies are for historians. In real life, they mean nothing. And uh, uh, there is interaction and influence in both directions. One of my friends was uh, the great uh, Dutch uh, architect, Aldo van Eyck, who was uh, deeply engaged in anthropological studies. When he became professor at the University of Delft, uh, the uh, chancellor, who was his friend, asked him to give, make a, his inaugural lecture on uh, Giotto's influence on Cezanne. He refused to do it and gave a lecture on Cezanne's influence on Giotto. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is, reveals the real essence of, of, of art. It is a timeless dimension in, in, uh, in, in the human, human world. Um, you mentioned this uh, uh, notion of touching the world, which I have used as title in a couple of my lectures. Uh, it really comes from Maurice Merleau-Ponty, uh, who has become probably my favorite uh, philosophical thinker. He uh, writes once that the paintings of Paul Cezanne make us feel how the world touches us. It's a beautiful, uh, humble mm -hmm. uh, sentence, but so full of mm -hmm. meaning. And uh, in the world, architectural world today, uh, we, we are guided towards uh, trying to express ourselves in our, in our work. It is nonsense, it is childish uh, to, to believe in self-expression. Art and architecture need to express the world, to express or show us uh, or activate our relation to it, to feel how the world touches us and we touch the world. And uh, the, my last comment at this point is that I am very worried of uh, the development of uh, the architectural profession around the world, which is uh, quickly losing its connection with the world of poetics and, and art and becoming a business oriented, uh, legalized, professionalist profession. I, at the age of 85, I am, I feel more amateur than I have ever felt in my life. And I'm very proud to, uh, to uh, acknowledge my uh, amateur attitude to everything. I, I think uh, the professionalist orientation takes away completely the existential dimension from, from architects, the existential and artistic dimension. So I uh, try to teach my students to forget, forget about the discipline, architecture as a discipline, professionalist discipline, and think about it as a, a humanist position as a privileged view of looking at uh, the world and human life and trying to mediate between those things. I'll stop here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I totally agree. Uh, I can say that uh, the notion of project is also making us uh, quite uh, quite uh, uh, 
you know, we know everything from the beginning. Whatever we do, we know that. Uh, maybe uh, project always project uh, based the things like research. We don't do research, but maybe through project, we do the research somehow. Of course, it's a very complicated thing. There are lots of uh, different, uh, a lot of different di disciplines come, come into scenery. Uh, but for example, I lived in Gemlik like that. I tried to explain that you are entering to school, a lot of discipline, a lot of lectures, a lot of you have to follow. Mm -hmm. And no, I mean, of course, there are some special teachers like my teacher that I mentioned, trying to ask, what did you, what did you do earlier? Uh, he was asking, but in general, there is a parameter, we have guts, I mean, uh, in an architectural education, this and that, and that they are beautiful, they are amazing architects. But how about the guy who is coming there, trying to find himself or herself and life, uh, how all those things come, come, can come together? Uh, I think the project-oriented uh, uh, uh, uh, Architectural education is also a little bit. Absolutely. Another word, in addition to project, that I, I doubt, I almost get uh, goose pimples when I hear the word solution. Mm. Architecture has solutions. He found a solution. I ask, solution to what? <laughs> because architecture pro pro projects are uh, related with life. Can we speak of uh, life as a project or life as a solution? No, not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, idea immediately uh, exposes its uh, insanity. Mm -hmm. But we still believe that architecture is projects and solutions. Mm -hmm. No, architecture is confessions. Mm -hmm. It is personal confessions by the uh, architect and everyone engaged in the process. It, uh, materializes beliefs, it uh, mat materializes wishes and intuitions. Mm. That's what uh, architectural, architectural design is. It's not uh, doing projects. Projects are things that you can wrap up and then uh, give and sell to the, to the client. But in my view, architecture is not that. Architecture is uh, something which is much more personal, much more intimate, hmm. and much more uh, strongly and directly uh, connected with life, our sense of life. But why, I agree, why we do always perfect things? Why everything's depending on the marks? Why we don't judge the students with their mistakes also? Like really, they make beautiful mistakes. I couldn't do it. Uh, why well, we judge uh, according to what we get? Well, uh, mistakes are more important than, than success because you don't learn really from success. You probably are enticed to repeat when you succeed, but when you make a mistake, you really learn. Hmm. And the same applies to to the polarity between uh, between uh, in uh, uncertainty and assurance, mm. academic education tends to uh, to teach assurance. You must be assured of what you intend to do. Mm. I say no, no. You have to maintain your uh, insecurity until the very, very end. As uh, uh, Joseph Brodsky, the great uh, poet, uh, writes, uh, insecurity is a more, more uh, active relationship with reality than, than uh, uh, certainty. Of course, mm. you, you are, your brains are working as long as you are uncertain and it stops when you mm -hmm. are assured. 
So I try to teach my students to maintain their insecurity, the capacity to toler tolerate insecure, insecurity and, and uncertainty as long as possible, because that's the source of energy and that is the source for imaginative thought. Mm. Imagination is killed by uh, certainty, mm. by definition. <laughs> yes, I mean, we, if we look at the nature, we see unbelievable uh, things. I mean, they are not always uh, uh, perfect. Uh, sometimes they are perfect. Sometimes they make things are making. Well, mo mo most of the uh, phenomena in nature uh, are imperfect. Yeah, that's the evolution that uh, that tries to make it perfect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Why this cannot enter to architectural education, uh, for example? Yeah, I agree totally. Uh, yes, mistakes has to be a part of education and has to be a part of life, like life. Everything cannot be perfect. Uh, mm. A lot of things are happening. We are just trying ourselves. I was so unsure about many things in my architectural life. I, I can't, I am still at 85. <laughs> I'm so insecure that I cannot show my sketch to my wife. <laughs> I have to protect it until, until uh, some uh, some de degree of assurance has arisen. <laughs> but isn't it good that uh, uh, your wife uh, Hannele will see your mistakes? Isn't it beautiful? Uh, or no, it's know, just, it, it's just uh, the identification in an early stage of thought. Mm. or design the the full identification with you mm. and the sketch. Mm. The sketch is not, you know, lines on paper. Yes. It's me opened up the heart yes. you know, revealed. That's right. And that, that's what makes it so, mm. so painful yeah. and, and vulnerable. Mm. And I, I hope that I never lose my insecurity. <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's great uh, where are we what are we doing now uh, according to program can we go further it's five o'clock the qu qu questions and answers you like questions you i like questions more than answers <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I can begin, uh, or you can begin. Why don't you? Okay, now I was going to ask you actually one question of me was, I mean, this book, Archipelago. Archipelago Essays on Architecture. Uh, a lot of people here. Marlon Blackwell. They are Kenneth, my friends. All of, all of them are my intimate friends. Yes. Christian Gulliksen, uh, Har Karsten Harris, John Heyduk, Mika Heikinen, Don Hoffman, Stephen Hall, Marco Komen, and Esa Lakson, and Daniel Libeskind, uh, Robert McCarthy Carter, Alberto Perez Gomez, uh, Nina Citrinsler Levin, uh, Philip Tidwell, Tidwell, Billy Tissian, uh, Leslie Van Dusa, Ben Weese, Cynthia Weese, Todd Williams, Colin uh, John Williams, Peter Zumthor. I know that this is your, your 70 years birthday gift that your friends wrote here. Yes, I, uh, I know. at that time I had an office of uh, 50 assistants mm. and this was produced behind my back. I had no, mm. no idea of it. And uh, I was thinking to ask you, uh, uh, uh, what is friendship for you? But you already explained a lot about that. 
equal I, I think I said the most yeah. important things, but I yes, yes. I also I would like to add that for instance in this very conference room, I have a, two pieces by the famous Finnish sculptor Kind mm. uh, In my storage room, I have two big sculptures by a, another friend, Prime Otrian. I was so close to these sculptors that I, I worked with them mm. I, mm. Uh, manually, uh, which is an extraordinary confidence that yeah. in such a intimate work as uh, painting or sculpture uh, you permit someone else to to in interfere mm -hmm. but um, that is the kind of intimate relationship with art that I uh, try to suggest to my my students um, it is not enough to read books. I have myself 10,000 books in my library around me here in the office, which is a kind of a forest for me. Whenever I write a new piece, I like to write it here in, in the middle of all the knowledge that I know of. Mm. This is a kind of a forest in, uh, and I uh, sit down in the middle of it and then ideas begin to, to, to mm. come because uh, I have this landscape of knowledge mm. Mm. and uh, good friends also work the same uh, they have the same function for instance one of my uh, intellectual friends was Sir Colin St. John Wilson mm. the architect mm. of uh, the British Library and uh, the Dean of the Cambridge School of Architecture uh, long after he died, mm -hmm. by the way, I was at his deathbed in, in London. Mm -hmm. Long after he died, and I was writing something, I used to uh, stop and, and think, what would Sandy think about this? So you can extend friendship beyond death. Mm -hmm. And another person who uh, has a similar continued uh, position in my world is, is Tapia Virkola. Mm. And I, I'm now very happy to, to have been uh, commissioned to design an exhibition of his sculptures Great. For, for next uh, fall to 2025, mm. uh, Yes. French friendships are, are really essential. And um, as I said already earlier, friendships can be, uh, can be uh, extended beyond your own lifetime. For me, uh, one of the great, great artists is, of course, uh, Johannes Vermeer. Mm -hmm. When I look at the uh, painting, a view of Delft. It, it is a big horizontal painting yeah. with a spot of orange uh, light in a small spot. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, this is uh, a spot that Marcel Proust writes about. Mm. Uh, he acknowledged the greatness of that spot. When I look at it, I feel that I'm looking at it next to Vermeer. And then I, when I continue looking at it, I feel that I, I'm becoming Vermeer. Mm. And that is the real gift of all art. We can hear with the ears of Bach. We can uh, understand human life uh, with the, uh, with the, uh, character of Shakespeare and, and we can feel the world through uh, great artists like uh, Rothko. Mark yeah, Rothko. Yeah. Yeah. Artists become extension of our 
our capacity to uh, sense the world and human relations. Hmm. This has been almost completely eliminated from architectural education, which has been killed by professionalist orientation. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying anything about education in Turkey because I don't know it enough, but I, I know in so many countries where I have taught. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, this is uh, this is book that uh, uh, gives a lot of clues about your architecture also, uh, like practicing side of your architecture and many of your thoughts. Actually, I can recommend uh, to people who wants to know more about you, this archipelago essays on architecture. Peter McKeith is the editor, and there is also another uh, Sensos uh, architecture. Sensos minimalism. So, sorry, Sensos minimalism. This is also very important uh, work uh, for your practicing, China. Yes, practicing site. Maybe people can uh, uh, look at them or find them. Let, let me confess here the mm. madness of my writing. I have now had uh, a young lady working in my office for half a year, cataloging my literary work. I have published now 72 books, 850 essays, and there are 1,600 unpublished lectures, uh, fully um, provided with footnotes. So I almost faint myself. What, what craziness! Uh, in that <laughs> case, this is this is. I, I, I want to add. Yes, I please. have no literary ambitions, whatsoever. All this uh, huge amount of writing comes from my uh, curious mind. I just want to know more. And the best way of knowing something is to write about it. OK. <laughs> OK. Will you ask to me something, or can I continue? Please continue. It doesn't matter much who, who, who is asking who. what. OK. <laughs> Why okay. are we writing, Yuani? Pardon me? Why we are writing? We are writing always. I mean, in your case, in my case, uh, uh, how it began and when did you begin to write? How, well, where are you writing? How you are writing? What is the atmosphere that you are writing? I wrote my first little article in 1966, I think. And from there, it has accelerated to the degree that in the last five years, at least, I have written one essay every two weeks. Uh, it is the excitement of try, uh, writing itself. Uh, writing is like going on an exploration. You just uh, uh, push your boat on the sea and, and uh, believe and hope that you end somewhere. That's what excites me. Mm -hmm. I have no other purpose, no other ambition. I also have uh, uh, characterized my writing as walks in a forest. Mm. And in fact, when uh, as I age, I realize it's the same forest all the time. I just take different uh, uh, paths through the forest. Uh, so in a way, my immense amount of writing is one single essay mm. with little uh, variations of what catches my eye on, on that visit. Mm. And then it opens up the other essay, like going. Well, like the next one, the next one comes uh, after that. I have never had any plans whatsoever mm. for my life, mm. for my profession, for my writing. Never. I just uh, follow the 
hints and and instincts, and of course, very much the uh, the requests mm. from people who appreciate my writing or know me around the world. Now my writings have been translated into thirty-eight languages, but I'm still in the middle of it. I, I don't. I'm not. Uh, regarding my <laughs> my work as complete. And uh, one thing that I think might have some interest is that when I uh, closed my office, the design activities in uh, 11 years ago, uh, I didn't feel for a moment that I have changed my profession. I'm uh, doing now architecture through my writing. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and that is why, because I'm not writing of, on architecture as a theoretical outside thing, I'm writing it as an experiential mental thing, mm -hmm. which means it is the, the very same as the experience of our architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, really, I, I scared a little bit when I began to write. I was writing earlier, but after making my two thesis uh, and uh, of course when you do your research kind of something you are following some uh, parameters yes this and that but after finishing them putting aside begin to write I uh, begin to ask to myself hey what are you doing uh, will the writing uh, cover your drawings because mm -hmm. Uh, architecture for me mostly to drawings like sketching, mm -hmm. uh, sketching course. also in uh, uh, very in the core of my kind of uh, architecture. But uh, because when you sketch, for example, you have a paper. Mm -hmm. Of course, you are. Uh, it's a very interesting process for both sketching, designing, and writing you need intellectual scaffoldings mm. to somehow uh, get you there. Yes, yes, but, to read but, but do not expose the sca scaffoldings. Mm. Most architects and, and writers reveal, exhibit the scaffoldings, mm. Mm. not the end result. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just you are making sketch by writing. Yes, in a way, yes. uh, uh, you make kind of uh, travel, like in the sketching, and you can make um, even uh, sometimes mistakes and uh, unsecure and uh, absolutely because the real subject matter of art and architecture is uh, the existential experience, mm -hmm. what it feels to be a human being in this world. Mm. That is what every single artwork and architectural work expresses. Mm. And um, that can be done in, in, in several ways, also purely through, through writing. And that is exactly why I think poets are so, so important. I uh, say very directly to the uh, student <laughs> audience, read poems. Mm. Poetry. My good friend uh, uh, Stephen Hall uh, accepts only poetry books in his bedroom. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not that selective, mm. but I advise my students never go to bed without having five or six good bo books on your night table next to your head. You don't even have to read them, they radiate wisdom. I think Stephen Hall is important guy yes, uh, is. Uh, for you because you did uh, Kias. I mean, he uh, won the Kiasma competition, and you have a beautiful uh, uh, exchange with him. You were explaining to me the first sketch of <laughs> him. Is it possible to just explain the uh, well? When Stephen came to Helsinki before the starting to work on the project, uh, we had a long dinner at our flat uh, and my wife had made um, 
mushroom soup. And we, Stephen and I had quite a number of glasses of red wine. And when he returned back to his hotel, had to hot, hotel room, which we he had intentionally hired next to the above the site, mm -hmm. competition site. He could not sleep, so he started to uh, make sketches of the site. For the Kiasma. For the Kiasma Museum. Mm -hmm. I happened to be then a couple of months later, half a year at the <laughs> Yale University. And Stephen asked me to be his uh, his critic, mm. and he sent me his uh, proposal, and I called him imme immediately. Stephen, forget you it. have forget it. You <laughs> have no chance with this. <laughs> and then he there was there were three days uh, left mm. for the competition. He went back to his first sketch, and he won. <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote here something that I have to read it. Just uh, uh, uh, Kenneth Frampton told me, Stephen, you must go to Helsinki. It will change your life. Uh, that always rings in my mind because he was right. Although I didn't realize that at that time he wrote a beautiful uh, preface to your uh, uh, uh, this the eyes of the skin. Eye, eyes of the yeah. skin the tiny tiny eyes yes something like that but I would like to read this also uh, on on on thin eyes thin eyes thin eyes thin sorry eyes. thin eyes yes and uh, uh, Libeskin is writing about you I could compare Ioannis' work to work of Carlos Carpa your practicing mm -hmm. side. It is work that you have to see and touch to truly know. It is lived on its interior usually, and only by going into it can the qualities be seen and felt and touched. Only in that way can the poetics of details be understood. This poetics of materials and connections approaches one definition of those fundamental dimensions I spoke of earlier. It is an experiential dimension Yuanni's works processes. Uh, I hardly recommend uh, to the uh, uh, people who wants to know more about uh, Yuanni Palasma, please read this uh, archipelago. It, and it other might books. be sold out. <laughs> it's probably sold out. In, maybe they can <laughs> find somewhere. Yeah. And now uh, I would like to come to my uh, uh, forthcoming uh, uh, uh, book. And in this book, there are lots of people, including yourself, Alvar Alto, as a king. You are the thinker, an observer, an architect, and many uh, with many things. And Mati Sanaxen, Pirio Sanaxenau, Seppo Salminen, Juho Gronholm. Anti Nozyaki, Samuel Wollstone, Eero Koivistoinen, Kimmo Lintula, Niko Sirola, Mikko Summanen, Aki Kaurismaki, Pantti Kareoja, Anu Puistinen, Ville Hara, Isidora, the architects of Hagia Sophia, Antemis, Antemius, and Jorge Luis Borges, even in, in, in my island. I have a kingdom I of have visited his house in Buenos Aires. Really? Yes. That's that's how, oh. how uh, uh, deeply he has uh, affected my thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, a kingdom of architecture and beyond. Uh, this is a kind of a little bit in the end uh, describing a perfect world like Finland uh, uh, between artists and architects. Uh, and then in the end, uh, in my first article about Alto, uh, even people get crazy and begin to make demonstration for the island. And then they negotiate and many things are happening. It's fictional, real and unreal stories. First, uh, beginning of your, your um, uh, beginning of your, uh, uh, I will begin a little paragraph from your uh, article that I wrote. 
you know what happened the alto time you know what happened af after alto and you leave you, you see a lot of things it happened before his talk in cairo the finnish ambassador approached oh, my talk in cairo yes yes not yes. Altos. no no not alto not <laughs> alto uh, this is the article that i wrote about yes, yes, yes, yes. Uh, the eyes of the skin yes, before yes. and after the title is yes, like yes. that it happened before his talk in Cairo. The Finnish ambassador approached uh, the podium and whispered to him, saying that Alvar Aalto has passed away. Ioanni was uh, dumbstruck. He told me about it during the course of a con conversation. He were having relieving that moment as he did so. In a way, I would thought he was immoral, he said. Immortal. The, immortal. Yes. Immortal. Not immortal. <laughs> immortal. He said at the time he had been unable to believe his ears. He is, comes to a uh, question to you. How was uh, how was living with Alto and without Alto? And what happened after that? Can you explain a little bit about that and your thoughts in the time of Alto and the time of in now? How do you see Alto? It was in, impossible to avoid Alto because, because he was everywhere. Because yes, yes, but, yes. yes but, it, um, because after that, uh, the article comes. Uh, that uh, you are uh, giving a you are doing a documentary uh frank and alvar frank gary frank gary and, frank yes, gary and you yes. are on the screen i can yes, hear yes. in the finland i'm watching it yes. uh, with the english uh, subtitles and and gary says that uh, uh, uh, frank gary's walt disney concert hall in los angeles mm. Uh, there was Esapek Kassalon and you and uh, Frank Gehry. And Esapek was in the film, but not in the conversation. No, no, no, yes. no, no, no. You were both. You yeah, sat down like in we the are auto, sitting down like house, this. Actually. Yeah. Ah. Yes. And uh, uh, uh, Gary said that he had been very influenced by Alto, adding that the Finnish architect had played an important role in his development. At one point, he turned to Johanny and said, but maybe the situation was different for you. After mulling over the question, Johanny offered a crisp reply, which summed up his version of Alto. He was everywhere. Yes, uh, he was, of course, a, an unquestioned authority which the generation of uh, students in the 60s and towards the late 60s of Paris Spring and, and Berkeley student movements and etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, began to question partly because Aldo was through his age becoming weaker in his uh, design uh, so that there was reason to to question his uh, the quality of his work. Mm. Um, well, but then when he uh, he died in nineteen seventy six. Seventy six. Yes. Uh, there was a long silence, of course, in the in the whole country particularly in the architectural profession. I myself began to read all those lectures and texts uh, really seriously after he was gone. Mm. I knew him and for instance, uh, traveled in Mexico together for a week mm. in the, in the uh, early sixties. But I, uh, I sensed 
and acknowledge his genius. Mm. But I had difficulties in accepting the uh, national authority that uh, that he he gained. Uh, I don't think he uh, worked himself for that purpose. It it just he was just such a giant, mm. cultural giant that mm. it fell naturally to him this mm. uh, position of a kind of a godlike figure. Mm. But in many ways, he was a very human human person. Mm. We had a, a lot of good drinks together in Mexico, for instance, during the week. Mm. Uh, I Now that time has passed, reading his texts uh, reveals the depth uh, of his, his uh, intuition and intellect, intellectual capacity. He, for instance, formulated uh, important, uh, uh, important biological uh, attitudes. Mm -hmm. For instance, he said, said once that, in my belief, architecture is related with biology. I think this is the discovery mm -hmm. of today, how strongly architecture is related with biology. So in my view, Alto is a prophet more today than he was in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, for me, uh, when I uh, arrived here, uh, first reaction uh, that I, I was showing, I said that no way, Alto covered a big blanket on the top of this architectural mm -hmm. culture, everywhere full of Alto's buildings and uh, and then later on, I asked to some uh, friends uh, about Alto. And then some of them said, I mean, one of them said, Alto is gone. Forget mm. it. Mm. It's Alto is gone now. We are, we are in a mm. new phase of well, life. Yes, that's that was the general understanding uh, in the, in the, during the 70s. At mm. least he had lost he, the edge of his architectural creativity. But even, but now, it is his general thinking, his design philosophy, his mm. his understanding of human culture and all of that, that uh, has uh, value, even more than his work. Uh, yes, uh, uh, but also if your your father is Alto, mm. think about that. Mm. You are, I'm not speaking for you because I I know how to find your way even in the time of Alto, like mm. that umbrella, it's very healthy to show your reactions. Uh, I, I, I read, for example, somewhere, I don't know, is it right or wrong, this walks and it's a church. Mm. Uh, uh, some people, including you, you, I don't know whether you were there, but some people were uh, criticizing the walks no, and it's no, church. No, okay. no, I wasn't there. In that case, I have I, always admired it. Very nice to yeah, hear because yeah. I I I like uh, I mean I like it a lot. This yeah, walks and sculptures. Uh, it's uh, uh, it uh, is also a lesson to the computer computer enthusiasts. Mm, mm. We don't need computers. Uh, yes, uh, computers uh, help in like ma a, in, in making turning architecture into into a business. Yeah, yeah. But they don't help in in in the uh, in turning it into an art. Yeah, and but what I was going to say, I'm I'm very happy to hear that because I like it very much. And uh, uh, Alto made some mistakes, for example, as an observer, as an outsider, uh, I saw. For example, I couldn't believe the how he demolished this academy, and there was a kind of theater there. Yeah, there was a beautiful, beautiful theater. Beautiful theater. Cinema I, theater. Yes, cinema theater, yeah. movie theater. And I didn't know that this movie theater is so beautiful, was so beautiful. Yes, and there was a uh, rather wide uh, civilian uh, movement to save it. Yeah, yeah. And Alto was uh, in, a, in, in an important place at that time. He resigned yes, and but a, a lot of things happened. But, but he built but when, this when academy. You, when you think of the situation today, architects have no power anymore. 
Aalto still still had, mm -hmm. so he can be criticized. But today, if someone wanted to turn a beautiful cinema into a into an office building, yes, uh, the architect would not have much to say. That is so sad mm -hmm. to confess. Mm -hmm. But that's partly, I think, because the architectural profession has lost its its um, cultural position. Yes, it's. it's uh, ethical ground, architecture is fundamentally grounded on ethics. Mm. And this has almost completely disappeared. Yes. Uh, uh, uh, this Altos case, uh, I mean, he was a giant. Uh, he was a world famous uh, yeah. uh, Finnish, uh, you know, value and yeah, uh, yeah. valuable uh, for Finland and, and uh, uh, for the architects uh, out in his generation and after his generation to find their way was very difficult, I am sure. Yeah, yeah. And that's sure, why I am, I am really uh, uh, approaching it that, for example, you found your way in this way. You change uh, the desk in a way. I mean, I, if I say like that, uh, maybe I can say, I mean, you change the destiny of architecture in some way so for some people. Well, uh, it's very, I can say, I, I, I, very beautiful I thing. Know, I know it because the, the uh, phenomenological uh, experiential attitude uh, has spread around the world. And mm. I am one of the uh, writers who started to, to uh, write about it. Yes, uh, this little book was core of it, actually, like really this. Eyes of skin. Well, the first one was, was the, uh, the questions animal. of perception. Questions of perception ah, ah. with Stephen Hall and, uh, and Gomez. Alberto Perez Gomez. Yes, yes, yes. But animal architecture was also very interesting to transform it. Well, uh, that, that was really uh, uh, bringing my childhood ex experiences mm. to the level of adult mature thinking. <laughs> But it's I I know that it's still the best document uh, in the world. Yes, on this yes. subject matter. Now uh, I would like to speak about the silence, because it affects me a lot. If it affected me, but we were in the jury together with you, and Peter Marquette, maybe Tom Simmons was there, and uh, you were speaking to a student uh, because student was doing something in the around the square or something. Uh, I wrote here, Ioanni spoke of the city squares of Finland as well as the dynamics of empty spaces as we were open to other imaginings. He posited that voids bear within themselves streets and unlimited potential. It was as though city squares would suddenly turn festive and all of a sudden the void would bear witness to a different kind of revolution, thereby taking on an entire new air. In those days, I experienced that approach as someone who was from the Mediterranean world. And I had imagined that common spaces in Northern cities, which were shared to varying degrees would be different in terms of emptiness and fullness, as well as sound and silence. But the imaginary void of which Yohanni spoke took root in my thoughts, becoming a revolution of a silence. Mm. What, yeah. how uh, silence, what is silence for you? How it affected your life? Uh, can you speak about it? Because I will mm. tell a couple of words after. Well, before answering your direct question, I just say that, that architecture, is a verb, it's not a noun. We have learned to deal with it as if it were a noun, mm. but it's always a verb. Mm. It invites, it promises, it directs and guides. Mm. Uh, and um, every square in, in, in the city or community, every empty space, is a potential, it is an invitation to act. Every uh, 
a revolution can take place uh, on any any square. Mm. That is the nature, uh, the active nature of of uh, empty spaces. And um, we tend to be taught and believe in architectural expression. I believe more in an architecture that holds back expression, which uh, aims at uh, silence, lack of expression. Because mm -hmm. in that case, then the uh, uh, individual can uh, uh, project the, the meaning, can project the experience. And um, the, the idea of silence goes very much against contemporary world, mm -hmm. which is about, you know, uh, making people be behave in the way you desire by making a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. But there is a special therapeutic quality about silence. And I know, uh, having taught uh, around the world, that there is an increasing in interest in, in silence. After, after living in this country uh, approximately 23 years, I uh, begin to fear also the value of uh, silence mm. because uh, in Istanbul or the other cities, uh, we have uh, a lot of noise around, yeah. a lot of people, a lot of activity, but uh, also in the world, uh, this uh, media, I mean, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and all the other uh, things, uh, every time you are alert position, you have to do something. Yeah, yeah. And in architectural education also like that, how this yeah. silence can be applied to yeah. architecture, doing mm. nothing, a student is coming, doing nothing and waiting, mm. waiting the moment, mm. but they are secure. Mm. Uh, I, I have written several times that there is uh, noisy architecture and silent architecture. There mm. is also quick and slow architecture. Mm. I'm more for the slow architecture because the slow architecture enables uh, uh, everyone to settle uh, his or her relationship with the, with architecture, whereas the quick and noisy one. Mm. Uh, Always in the scene. Forces, uh, yes, forces you to behave in a certain way. Should we uh, permit the audience to ask questions or? Yes. Thank you so much for this enlightening dialogue. Uh, now we will move on to the question and answer session. Um, I will give a little instruction for our visitors. Uh, we have very limited time for Q&A, so please keep your questions short and clear. Uh, we prefer to listen to your questions from yourselves, with your cameras and your microphones are on. Uh, so instead of writing to the chat box, uh, please use the right hand button so I can unmute you and let you speak. Um, just a quick reminder for you to activate your interpretation buttons. It's on the uh, bottom right on your screens. So you can just choose the language that you would like to hear. Our translators will be translating from Turkish to English as well. So you can ask your question in Turkish or in English, which one you prefer. So I will start with uh, Hilmi Tunahan Çetinkaya. I'm unmuting you. Ee, önce teşekkürler. Öncelikle herkese merhaba, iyi günler dilerim. Ee, adım Hilmi Sunan Çetin Kaya. Ee, İzmit Kocaeli şehrindeyim. Ee, Kocaeli Üniversitesi 2. sınıf mimarlık öğrencisiyim. Ee, sorum da şöyle olacak. Aslında ben ve arkadaşım Neslihan Zeynep Cerahoğlu ile birlikte düşünmüştük. Bu konferansı da birlikte izliyorduk. Ee, şöyle... Bir tasarıma başlarken ya da tasarıma devam ederken nasıl düşünüyorsunuz? Bunu merak ettik ve soruyoruz.
Well, if I answer first, I take one of these books of walls behind me, particularly of uh, the early Renaissance painters of uh, Siena school or Fra Angelico and look at them. I never, never uh, look at journals uh, uh, showing similar uh, you know, projects by other architects. I want to tune myself to a humane uh, atmosphere and feeling, and then, then start. Uh, for my case, uh, of course, I try to read uh, uh, some, some parts from the uh, novels, for example, uh, uh, or I go to nature uh, to walk, uh, and the cafes are very nice that I really like and uh, sit down there, watch the people, uh, uh, you know, just go out of the uh, framework of this uh, uh, project. Uh, even when I write, I do the same thing. And I, I think uh, the best thing to go out of architecture somehow and then come back it that I, I believe uh, with, a, with a powerful uh, mind. Uh, I think so. Well, I was just looking for for some book. Uh, there, there are well altogether. I think in in starting a design work or even beginning to write an essay, the first thing, at least for me is to calm myself down, mm. to get some beautiful feelings in my mind. Mm. And that is why I read a poem or a few, mm. or I look at uh, Fra Angelico or uh, painters like that. Uh, and that somehow establishes a, a silence. Mm. So I, I, I never rush to the technicalities. Hmm. Uh, the functional technical aspects because they have much secondary role. Hmm. And, the, and also uh, I go, for example, seaside or, or nature. Uh, everything is ready to be transformed uh, to something else. Uh, even you see a, a leaf dried uh, or uh, I mean, we, we, we have to learn uh, how to look at around, but not look at and to analyze it for your purpose, uh, because everything is ready to be transformed to something else. Mm -hmm. And invisible actors they are. If you yeah. transform it to architecture in that way, you have incredible amount of uh, library. I mean, of course, just, books and those. Yeah. Just before you came, yeah, I was working on a little, uh, essay of a Slovenian artist architect. And uh, I uh, quoted Bachelard's idea where he says, uh, uh, we think that um, imagination is something that gives form to things. Mm. No, imagination, true imagination does the reverse. It uh, it uh, um, dismantles forms mm. and makes them uh, able to reconnect with ev everything else. Uh, I think that kind of mentality is important in one's design work, uh, and even writing is to uh, not to focus too much, but also mm. scatter your attention. Cafes are very beautiful for that. Right? When yes. I go, for example, the voices are like all around a kind of making tempo. You feel that you are living, you are sharing Jean, to Jean work. Paul Sartre wrote most of his books mm. in Parisian mm. cafes. He's right. He's right. <laughs> I don't know. Did you get uh, the proper answer? Uh, do you hear me? You mean? Thank you for your questions. 
Okay, we have five more questions. I will introduce with Murat Arda. Please unmute your microphone. Hello. <clears throat> Sorry about my voice. I have a bit cold. Uh, it's an horror. It's an echoing. There's an echo. Uh, it's okay right now? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's an honor for me. I'm joining as a writer, uh, as a, a novelist in, this, in that uh, event. And I wrote your amazing book, uh, The Eyes of the Skin. And uh, it's a very inspired of me. And in that book, you talk about touching the world as an architect uh, or an artist. But let's look at the example of Istanbul. Today, Istanbul has lost all its identity as a city. Uh, when we look at the city right now, uh, we see only pain and sorrow as an art and an arch architecture. It's it's like there's no hope. Uh, how can we deal with uh, this feeling of pain and grief as an artist and as an citizenship citizen? Uh, we may not be able to bring back the old old days, old golden days, but how can we deal with this great sense of defeat? Can you, can you uh, suggest a way out of this crisis of humanity and artlessness? Uh, thank you so much. Well, if I answer your question, I, I share your concern and almost panic. Um, we dealt with this issue uh, in the very, very beginning. Uh, I think it is uh, strongly related with the uh, unfortunate uh, chains of architect architectural practice turning into professionalist business, uh, like uh, the professionalist business of engineers and, and lawyers. But architecture is something totally else. Architecture is existential. Architecture, as we said earlier, is not solving a problem or, uh, or uh, facilitating this or that. It is giving an expression of how it is to be a human being in this world, in this partic particular place. But that intention has very much disappeared. It has totally disappeared from the minds of the clients, but it has almost totally disappeared from the minds of designers also. Um, a, uh, a, pay, a place can only be, uh, how would I say, radiate uh, humanity and pleasure if those things have been invested in, in it. Uh, a, a pleasure does not arise from physical world or physics. It arises from human intention. Hmm. I can just add something. Uh, but we have to still hopeful. Uh, uh, for example, I am living in Finland. I came from Mediterranean. Uh, the sunshine is beautiful always uh, in our sight. But in Finland also, we have long uh, sunny days. Uh, and uh, summer is amazing. But the winter, this time of the year comes now. These are the signals that we are having the darkness now, slowly, slowly. Mm. But one day, some years ago, I decided that try to find a beautiful side of the darkness somehow. Really, the darkness I've... is magical. Yeah, darkness it's is magical. magical, really. It, it, it and, is uh, and believe one, me... one uh, how would I say, dimension of, uh, of silence yes. and loneliness. Yes. Yes, I mean, the, to be uh, in that kind of position also, you are having amazing chance in this world to find kind of uh, your roots, your, your uh, whatever you will find there in a 
I mean, it's a magic, magic. That's why I am now uh, comfortable, very comfortable. When the darkness is coming, I say, okay, come. I will find a better thing and go to nature or do whatever I do. And I can suggest that, apart from Yuani's uh, comments. Thank you, Murakana. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, now I move on to Barish Kavarolu. He's also one of our uh, graduates. Can you unmute yourself? Oh, can you hear me? That's a little noisy, but I can't hear you. It, this is, here is a little crowd, uh, unfortunately. Uh, uh, hello, first of all, I want to thank you, both of you, for this beautiful talk. Uh, it was a pleasure to listen. Uh, my question will be, uh, do you see any direction or approach, ongoing approach in the world of architecture where architecture can meet with uh, poetry and art again? I have had the chance of uh, traveling around the world quite a lot. Uh, um, for six years as member of the Pritzker uh, jury, for instance. So, and I was once the chairman of a Pan-American competition of architecture in, uh, in um, Ecuador, maybe eight years ago. It was a competition open to uh, all American, North, South, Mid Middle and North uh, America. And there were big, huge companies and hundreds of projects. It was won by a young architect who had built a house for his family in a bamboo forest using only bamboo. Cutting, you know, the bamboo, uh, opening in the bamboo forest and then building the house. What a beautiful thing. And this uh, project beat all the huge office complex and cultural centers and all of that, simply because it had this existential honesty. Mm. And it expressed what architecture really is. It is uh, placing a human being or a family in the world. And this uh, project did it so minimally and so forcefully at the same time, poetically. So I find for me, one of the uh, main criteria for archi good architecture is, uh, uh, is its, uh, how would I say, economy of means. Uh, today, we tend to, or architects, tend to exagger exaggerate everything form, size, complexity, materiality, and all of that, uh, the real power comes from simplicity, from reducing all of this complexity. Johanny, I will tell one thing. Uh, uh, I was teaching with Seppo in Kota Academia, Academia, mm. this uh, our Academy of Fine Arts. And you came to our Crete. Uh, you remember from from yes, US, yeah. you were in Taliesin. Uh, yes, you were uh, a scholar there. You, yes. They invited you there. Yes, and you were even kind of jet lag. Maybe you just arrived to Finland and you came to our studio. I with, remember. With, with set, <laughs> we sat down like that. We continued the second part of it, second boundaries course. Yes, we went to Istanbul. It was incredible. Artists, art students were incredible. But one memory that I remember, we went uh, with Seppo one day uh, before students, students were coming to our studio. We were trying to uh, uh, organize the place and Seppo is an artist, I'm an mm. architect. I am a little bit further, I am, I'm quite close to art. I don't mm. know what kind of art architecture I am, but kind of art oriented uh, mm. kind of guy, kind mm. of architect. I, we were trying to pull the tables there. There are two tables. One of them is long. One of them is short. 
and one of them is high, the other one is low. But one of them were full of different paintings on it, the crazy table, uh, scratches, and some kind of beauty was in it. And the other one was quite polished. Mm. And then we put them together, like made them together, mm. the people will sit down. Mm. I instinct, <laughs> instinctively, I said I did like that to Seppo. Mm. What the hell, what's, what, what is this? And Seppo said, just table. Mm. Just table, like uh, when you uh, said about the form. Uh, I mean, uh, I think that we will, we have to get a lot of uh, uh, things from art education. Mm. I was teaching that two years. I mean, uh, they were very close to the life. If you mm. compare with the architectural mm. schools, really they are using their own uh, anecdotes of the life and mm. so on. We just built, we just do the walls. Is, is, is it so difficult to make four walls for a house? Mm. But they are really looking different type of things. Mm. And uh, I can just, just say it like that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your answers. Good question, Chris. And um, now we will move on to Alieva. I'm unmuting your microphone. Please keep your questions short and clear. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, um, thank you for this uh, sincere um, talk. Um, I'm, I'm a student at TU Delft, uh, second year master, and I was doing my research on the relation between architecture and uh, cinema. And uh, I was uh, thinking, I was going to ask, uh, like, uh, what uh, do you think there is such a thing as cinematic architecture and how can it be defined? And uh, uh, how can we use the techniques of filmmaking in uh, as a design methodology and what kind of uh, quality it can bring to architecture. And thank you. This, this was my questions. Well, I have written a book entitled uh, Architecture of the Image, Existential Space in Cinema uh, as a facsimile because uh, I have maybe 500 images, it would be impossible to get the originals again to, mm -hmm. together. So it will be produced as a facsimile. Uh, to me, cinema is, is the art form that is closest to architecture, simply because both art, art forms deal with existential lived space. They are almost the same, same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I have myself learned so many things from cinema, uh, not perhaps technicalities, not for instance, uh, ideas of montage or, or reverse time or things like that, but the condensation of uh, emotion in an, in an image. For instance, you might know the uh, film um, by the Danish uh, film director. Um, what's his name? The, uh, um, oh, pardon me? Yes, exactly. Uh, and the film film is uh, the dog. What's the name of it? <laughs> Dog. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My age is showing more and more. In Dogville, all architects should watch the see the film because the state sets are very minimal. Usually there are just white chalk lines on a black floor indicating entry living room, kitchen, and so forth. But the drama develops mm. to full, you know, passion uh, within those uh, uh, limited in, in instructions. 
uh, I'm saying this as an as an example, one example. I have myself written about the minimalism of Hitchcock, certain Hitchcock's films, uh, like uh, Rope. Uh, the cinema directors can teach us quite a lot in the same way that they have learned from, from architects. Some of the best uh, uh, modern contemporary film, film directors have studied architecture, Antonioni, uh, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, I always often refer to Walter Benjamin's idea in, in his essay on architecture and cinema of 1926, I think, where he surprisingly uh, suggests that architecture and cinema are both tactile arts. Mm. For 1926, this is quite a surprising uh, suggestion. And um, the idea of tactility in both art forms is, which means also the, uh, the strength of the reality experience is true. Uh, I would say, as my, uh, the title of my book suggests, I consider the existential experience and the existential space, which mixes the architectural and lived uh, reality together, is the one that uh, unites architecture cinema. Hmm. It's a kind of uh, constructing the story, like in architecture, we yes. try to construct the story, construction uh, we do. Uh, uh, and then when we write, we do the, we do the same thing. Yes, but uh, in architecture, like, we construct open-ended, uh, open-ended sequences. Yeah. Uh, architecture becomes almost un unbearable if it uh, but uh, closes yes, the yes. experience too much yes in in the when you write for example you are so free you can really go to open ended uh, yes site mm. uh, in architecture to make it is really a big thing uh, yes but in very cinema important thing, very important, important thing. yeah in in cinema also must be like that yes. yeah. well i am particularly fond of of um, Andrei Tarkovsky's uh, mm. films, which are pure poetry. Yeah. And also his, his books, uh, particularly uh, Sculpting in Time, is a fantastic uh, book for architects to read. Thank you, Alieva, for your question. OK, um, I would like to state something as our time is limited. Uh, we won't be having uh, any more questions than what we already have. So uh, four last questions, just to let you know. Uh, thank you. Uh, Gulistan, and now you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I wonder, maybe it can be a general one. Uh, uh, how do you think that the hapticity will evolve in the virtual world? Because, you know, with the COVID, most of the mediums adopted into virtual world and sense of the space navigation time and direction uh, is changing as well. So do we still need to seek that hapticity as well? Thank you. <laughs> I am very doubtful of all the virtual dimensions including virtual love. <laughs> uh, I, I think we, uh, we are embodied neurological uh, uh, cre creatures who are related with the world through our bodies. Mm -hmm. So virtuality is just a gimmick. It, it's just a technical invention which might have a use in a specific scientific context uh, to experiment certain things. Uh, in experiments where you reduce, but life is not a reductive thing. It is, it is uh, an additive thing, a complex thing. Uh, so my answer is, I do not believe in those. 
I I feel uh, uh, no sir when I when I see virtual things, simply because they are not rooted in human reality. Hmm. I think so. Uh, I mean, we do we did uh, some courses uh, through the virtual sharings, like in the Zoom. It was uh, not so easy, but I would like to add to you. You said that. Uh, once you said that there are no abstracts in life. Life is always long story. When we were discussing some days ago. Have I been that wise? <laughs> <laughs> you said like that. Because abstract is a, a kind of research term. Um, I guess uh, we are entering the territory of the research, but uh, I liked it very much. There are no abstract in life. Mm. Life is always long story. I liked it very yes. much. <laughs> to yes. summarize and give spotlight, like fragmentation is not so mm. yeah. uh, no, good. No, I still, I still believe, and uh, and of course, life can be uh, and needs to be a subject matter for poetry and novels and cinema and theater and so forth. Uh, but life itself, what I say here is mm. life itself mm. uh, as, as an as a, uh, uh, existential experience. Uh, the, I keep say, uh, repeating the word existential and I feel that I, I need to separate it from uh, existentialism, which was a mm. uh, particularly French uh, orientation of uh, philosophy after the war, after the disasters of the Second mm. World War. And of course, uh, Jean Paul Sartre was one of the leading existentialists. And so was also uh, Maurice Merleau Ponty, who then uh, shifted to a a uh, more poetic uh, mm. view of life and reality and the two gentlemen who were friends until that point became, you know, distanced, distanced. Um, we must think, I mean, we must separate uh, between things that we know and things that we theorize and things that we live. Uh, a great confusion arises from mixing these, these dimensions. They are all real, but they uh, take place in different realities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in the same way, art and science are two absolutely different realities. They are not opposite each other, but they have nothing in common mm. uh, because they are in two different worlds. The, the world of, uh, of uh, conceptual, conceptualized reality and the world of lived reality, which mm. are two absolutely exclusive things. In that case, why we don't add uh, to architecture like uh, life instances, like outside of architecture, there are circles like circles, for example, daily life is mm. another thing when yes. you go out and then life is beginning there. Yes. And then when you go to nature, another life you see. Mm. Yes. And why we capsulate caps everything like a laboratory, uh, making a kind of laboratory that uh, perfect objects will be created or perfect things because will be created. We are taught. Yes. And we believe in architecture as aesthetic statements, not existential statements. Yes. In that case, the, the chaos of Istanbul or crowdness of Istanbul, what we see is there can be an incredible thing to get something uh, out of it, out of it uh, 
and to create something. I mean, uh, it's a kind of, there is an energy there. Of course. Like yeah. we have energy here with empty spaces and, uh, you know, calmness and so on. But in there, same way, just opposite genre, maybe, uh, we can see uh, in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. In that case, everything is changing, parameters are changing. But that is, that, that, that is how, how human life and culture is energized including political political life is energized by this you know undercurrents mm. of uh, collective life uh, also architecture fundamentally it, it expresses this this uh, un undercurrents mm. um, yes but they are difficult difficult to uh, to to tame in a democratic state uh, reality, they are difficult to tame. When I was designing the Compi Center, which was the mm. largest project in Helsinki at that time, mm. and I had to introduce the project to, to various committees. Every time what interests, interested the democratically chosen members of these committees was how are the windows washed? <laughs> no one ever asked, does this have a mental meaning? <laughs> hmm. I'm, I'm not, not at all speaking against the democracy. I'm just repeating what Alvarado once wrote, democracy is a difficult client. <laughs> but, but, okay, but of course someone or some people can live in a very a perfect atmosphere. Mm. Like we live here, it's an incredible atmosphere in Finland. I am very comfortable. But I think the magic is also to find way to live in that kind of places. I mean, we, because we constructed, uh, especially with the architecture, how to construct ourselves, how mm. to live, how to stand up and find our way. Mm. Of course, I can find my way on the sea, like mm. I was finding in the mm. in in, in Gemnik. But uh, mm. I think uh, we have all a responsibility to find our ways and show some lights for the future. Of course, uh, and either that, this way. And the reality this... is that when you are designing and constructing a building, you are really constructing yourself. That's right. But that is a, a point which is not. Uh, emphasized in schools of architecture, in most of them. And also, do we need to build this amount of buildings in everywhere? Mm. The whole the world, I mean, including Finland, for example, I see a lot of new things because it helps to economy. Mm, yes. Uh, in a political wise, it no, could. That, that's a current issue now in Finland. It, yes. It's simply. Too much is being built. Yeah, in, in in Turkey, in Istanbul, for example, when you go with the uh, airplane, you see incredible. Mm. Uh, this was the actual cause of the great uh, suppression in in America, was the hundreds of thousands of uh, flats that were built and empty. They they they, they yeah. were built as investment, but there was no use for them. This was in Obama's time. Yeah, he couldn't do it. Uh, do about it because of the divided America. Mm. But let's mm. not go further mm. to political to discussion. Yeah, why we built a lot? <laughs> this is a question. And then why we always teach to to make buildings? Okay, some people. I mean, you can do. But some people want to write, for example. Yes, and the best best project is is the one where no building is uh, required. Yeah, if the, still... the situation is analyzed in such a an intelligent way that a building is not necessary at all. Yeah, that's the best project. Yeah, ecologically also. <laughs> Okay, then thank you, Yulisan, for your question. I will move on to Talha, QJ. Can you please unmute yourself? Is it okay right now? Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, I'm a student at Wef University. Firstly, uh, hello. And I'm in prepared class. It means in Turkish, we are just trying to improve our English. After that, we will go to faculty. Uh, so I don't even start my education. Um, I just want to improve myself about anything related at architecture. But I don't know where should I begin and what should I do. Uh, I know this is a huge question, but I want to hear from you, all of you. Thank you. For me, I told earlier to go to cafe and sit down and listen, uh, whatever you do there, go to nature. And, uh, and uh, uh, novels are so important uh, to read and to imagine, uh, select your uh, uh, writers. Uh, but uh, uh, uh, uh, look to the uh, daily life uh, uh, uh, instances. Uh, they are beautiful. They are incredible. I mean, uh, many of them, not in a perfect way, but find what you see behind. Uh, I, I can say like that. And uh, uh, what I try to do, uh, I write notes to myself. Uh, in a in a for an article or whatever I do for a, some kind of design or whatever, but I write small small notes for myself, and then they are accumulating. And one day when I look at them, oh, I said, okay, I was here, and then I find the essence of the uh, uh, uh, uh, story of the article. Anything, okay. everything is in everything. And you can find everything in everything, I guess. Yes, my suggestion uh, would be to turn your eyes inside yourself, who you are. That's it. <laughs> That was the answer. <laughs> and if you, are, if, <laughs> I like if you much. have difficulties, <laughs> doing it, read Rainer Maria Rilke. Whoa. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, hey, Jankat, if you're ready, you can pick up. First of all, uh, thank you for time to uh, talk with us. Uh, I think it was very beneficial. Uh, I was talking about two points that you have mentioned. Uh, you have told us about you are very concerned about uh, the art and poetics uh, in architectural development. And also you said that I prefer questions over the answers. And now I want to ask you a few advice about what young architects should ask about the development of architecture in poetics and arts. Well, speaking about questions and answers, the important thing is that in design and arts, the question and the answer arise simultaneously. Uh, an artistic uh, product is never an answer to a question. It is also a question. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is why uh, the artistic poetic world has another logic than the scientific uh, or intellectual world. And that is something that also uh, students need to learn or, or more exactly to have confidence to uh, rely on things that do not or answers situations that do not follow normal logic. Art never follows normal logic. Uh, art follows existential logic, which is another thing than mathemat mathematics or physics. And, uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately, schools usually teach nothing about existential uh, logic, or perhaps a better word would be existential intelligence. Mm. Uh, we, we have uh, the, the, uh, 
people who deal with uh, human intelligence, they limit human intelligence into very uh, few criteria. There is uh, biologically uh, derived knowledge far beyond, but far beyond that, which is not considered in the in the much in the academic world. Um, simply, uh, our senses process uh, the world, our image of the world. So we have sensual uh, sensual intelligence. We have embodied uh, uh, intelligence. We have emotive in, in, intelligence and ex existential intelligence and, and many more. So one advice would be to, to enlarge your scope to accept things that do not usually belong to the discussion or conversation mm. about human qualities. Thank you. Thank you, Janka, for your question. Um, now um, I will move on to Abraham Berger's quote on Thales, because the other person is not, you know, turning on their camera, so I cannot see you. Abraham, if you're ready, you can speak up. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I would like to know um, what aspect do you consider uh, essential to design uh, this kind of architecture, this kind of sensual, sensual architecture? Uh, well, as you mentioned, uh, art is fundamental, yes, but what kind of aspect, material or immaterial aspect, participe in this process of conceptualizing and uh, materializing the, the architecture? Thanks. Please. Well, not uh, to design try to design uh, the building as a material object or as a conceptual presentation, but as a human experience. Architecture, to, in my view, is choreography. It is choreography of behavior in a very wide and fundamental way. So, students of architecture should understand uh, the choreogra choreographic uh, dimension of uh, architecture. As it happens tomorrow, a famous uh, Spanish dance couple, modern dance couple will come for a week to meet me because they have been so impressed by my, my writings. Mm. So I'm saying this just to uh, indicate that uh, the idea of choreography also ties architecture with, with dance. Mm. Uh, I think the problem, the mistake would be to see architecture as a closed discipline. The liberating uh, attitude would be to see it as, a, as an op open discipline that wants and wishes to uh, connect with other, other fields. Nowadays, the biological connections are, are very, very important. I, I, I have just written an essay, a lecture, which I will give in two weeks about beauty and ethics, mm -hmm. and which ends with uh, biological arguments, beauty in, in nature, which has not been much touched upon but it might well be the guiding principle of natural processes might, might be beauty. <laughs> thank you, Abraham. Thank you, thank you. Okay, now we have one last question. Uh, from Ufuk Dorisos. Actually, he was the first one to ask, but 
I waited because I wanted to give the you know first chance to people who are in the Zoom room. Uh, I've written down in the chat box, so if you like to check it out from there, you can. But I will uh, read it in Turkish as well. Uh, he said, uh, Hüseyin'cim sağ ol bu konuşma için. Merle Ponti'nin Palazma'nın yazılarında önemli bir rol oynadığı görülüyor. Ne zaman başladı bu etki? diye sormuş. Well, in my case, uh, the important point was when I uh, worked uh, two and a half years in, in Africa, in Ethiopia. I began to read anthropological and psychoanalytic uh, literature. And uh, then uh, a bit uh, later, later uh, uh, phenomenological uh, philosophy uh, I I can uh, I think uh, if I have to name one single book that was uh, decisive for me it is uh, uh, Gaston Bachelard's Poetics of Space that was pointed out to me by Danny Liebeskind in 1979 at the book bookshop Mm -hmm. of the Cranbrook Academy. And that that uh, energized my, my shift from intellectuality towards the acceptance of the power of the poetic image and poetic thinking. There are numerous others. Uh, earlier I was in, in the late 60s, I was impressed by Erich Fromm, uh, for instance, the uh, social therapist, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and and many many others. So I entered this uh, world of uh, the world of thinking about what we humans are uh, through. Uh, specific scientific realms like anthropology and uh, psychology uh, uh, and then gradually I shifted towards uh, philosophical thinking now nowadays I I'm almost entirely uh, working in the philosophical realm I have never studied philosophy in, in any university, mm -hmm. but some of the finest philosophers in the world are my friends. And here again, friendship comes, uh, enters with mm -hmm. a distinct importance. I uh, am not scared to make philosophical mm -hmm. statements and arguments because of my friends, philo philosopher friends like Karsten Harris, who's the professor of philosophy mm -hmm. at Yale, Yale University. So what I'm suggest saying here is that one sort of drifts into the things that then later become important to you and they constitute a whole, a, a, a life's position as uh, the existential uh, viewpoint is for me now. I might be too old at this point to change it anymore. <laughs> but mm. I, I have nothing against changing my view again. Uh, I often uh, quote a Polish proverb, which goes, only a cow doesn't change her opinion. I willingly change my opinion if I find myself having been wrong. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you for your answers. And thank you for uh, the questions as well. Um, 
it was very enlightening. I think all of us have to, you know, take the time to think about this uh, dialogue again. Um, now, um, I think we you can wrap up our event. Uh, I'd like to thank Yohani Palazma and Hussein Yanar again uh, for the expertise you have shared with us today. Uh, it was a great honor and a great pleasure for us to have you in Aura. Um, and actually, this conference could not have happened uh, without uh, Hussein Yanar, our dear friend, Aura Dostu. His contributions were, is very important for us as well. Um, and last but not least, I have to, uh, and I'd like to thank our sponsor of the special event, Stoneline Collections. Uh, they have made many uh, valuable contributions throughout the years, in five years throughout our life. Um, and I, maybe Yilmaz Bey, you, you would like to add something else? Just uh, want to thank uh, again uh, our guests. Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, dialogue, uh, talk uh, about life, art, architecture, everything. Uh, and uh, I'm sure it will be very uh, useful for our uh, young uh, architects and uh, students uh, to uh, widen their view uh, of life and uh, their approach to art and architecture in general. It was really wonderful was, uh, I think, one of the best uh, lecture or speech um, in Aura existed by now. Uh, and it will be unforgettable for us. I hope we re uh, repeat this conversation again in Istanbul as soon as possible. Thank you very much for your contribution. Can I tell us. you something? Can I tell you a couple yes. of words? Uh, yeah. Johanny, is important for me and important for this country. And of course, Aura is important for us, uh, uh, for, for, for Istanbul. And I, uh, it was really great pleasure uh, to, to discuss uh, with dear Johanny uh, uh, freely uh, as a part of life. Uh, when, we, when I watch it again, I will say, well, I had to say like this, like that, like that. But Life is something like that. Thank you very much, Yoni. Uh, it was a great I, pleasure. I will just add one, one comment. A few, 10 years ago, I, I had seven conversations at the University of uh, Minnesota uh, at the request, uh, at the invitation of the chancellor with a radical American film, uh, sorry, theater director and actor, lady. We lived the, the two weeks that we, during which we gave the seven uh, talks or conversations in the same hotel, but we never met. We <laughs> never met even for mm, breakfast because we didn't want to spoil the authenticity of the conversation. I think uh, this conversation was an authentic one yeah. because we had not scripted it. No, no, no. Yeah. Just, it was just part of life. That is uh, spontaneous. Uh, yeah, architecture has to be a part of life. We are a part of nature, and something like that it happened. Thank you. I may like to uh, add something. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, sharing us your wisdom and knowledge. Uh, in a very nice and uh, warm atmosphere. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. Sorry, I hope it's true. Uh, well, and uh, uh, I guess uh, I would also uh, extend my uh, appreciation uh, that this whole conversation uh, increased my confusion, and that's not a bad thing, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's, that was probably the message of today. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. I think, yeah, we can wrap our event right now. Again, I'd like to thank everyone who 
joined today. Um, and I hope I can see you. I mean, we can see you in the next Jomartis RS conference in two weeks. So uh, be safe and take care. Goodbye. Bye-bye.